continue in our series on the, la- the days of the latter rain. And today is a day of restoration. And the Lord just stirred this on my heart. It's a day of restoration. And I know that in the past we've, we've talked about the, these truths and we've, we, about two years ago I actually took this text. But, but I feel that we're at a point in our church where we need to, to take hold of that truth in God's Word that God has a heart to restore that God wants to restore marriages. He wants to restore broken lives, woundedness and hurt. He wants to restore lives that have been given to the enemy and, and, and been devoured by Him. God is a God of restoration. Amen? I'm looking forward to, to our altar call today because I believe that God's going to bring genuine restoration in the lives of people today. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Joel. The book of Joel. Joel chapter 2, I want to begin with verse verse 23. We'll begin with verse 23 today. Also, if you want to uh, keep your place there, I'm also later on going to refer to Acts chapter 2 where this portion of Joel is quoted. I'm also going to refer to Luke chapter 3 today. Those are our three main texts Verse 23, chapter 2 of Joel. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. Do we do enough of that? No, we don't. We need to do more, right? Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain, in the first month. The threshing floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with new wine. So I will restore to you the years. I want you to say that with me. So I will restore to you the years. Then Joel begins to list the circumstance of what the nation had gone through. He's going to restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be put to shame. This isn't the focus today, but I love that. People who put their trust in Jesus shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my Spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth. Blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall turn into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said among the remnant whom the Lord calls. Lord, we just ask that you just bless this passage of truth in your word to our hearts. Lord, I pray that today we would open up to the restoration that you have for us. No matter what area we need restoration, Lord, we call upon you today to meet that need in each of our lives. That we would leave this place today restored in the name of Jesus. In verse 25, that's our focus. So I will restore the years to you. That's what the Lord says. So many times we get caught up in the years that we waste, the time that we waste. And all of us waste time. Some of us have lived for the enemy and spent years of our life and we've just wasted those years because we haven't been living for God and fulfilling His plan and His purposes. But we've been living for the enemy. Living for the flesh. And we look and we realize and we come to our senses and we say, 
God, I'm sorry. I wasted all those years. How could I have wasted that time? And God says a, a very powerful, I will restore the years. Yes! <laughs> I love that. God's greater than time. He invented it. God's greater than the time that you've wasted with foolish things. You may have just come to Jesus and you may be 80 or 90 years old. And God says, I can restore the years that you've wasted. That's the God that we serve. In this passage, he, he lit, Joel begins to list the, the circumstances of the day, the devastation and what's been taking place. He says, the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust. There are four different types, species of locusts. They came through in waves, one after the other. What the first one didn't eat, the second one ate. What the second one didn't eat, the third one ate. And, and then the fourth one. And by the time the fourth one was through, there was total devastation in the land. Complete devastation. There wasn't any food. They were an agricultural nation. They depended on not only the food for their own sustenance, but they depended upon the food, the agriculture. That was their whole economy. So in one, t one moment of devastation, their, their sustenance was gone and their economy was gone. Nothing of devastation in your life is any greater that God cannot heal it. I'm sure that they were just saying, how could this have happened? Earlier in this passage, Joel uses a phrase. He says, basically, have you ever seen anything like this before? And some of us feel that way. Have you ever seen any devastation in your life? like what I'm going through right now. And God says, I'm going to restore the years. I'm going to restore the years. I love that. In this passage, God also says that this is His great army. The locusts were created by God. All these different species of locusts, they were all created by Him. They were His great army. But when we read that, many times we get the wrong idea about God. We think God's, He's just getting even. God's vindictive. I'm going to get you, you didn't do what I said. Have you ever heard anybody talk like that about God? Church, God is not vindictive. That is not what happened. Everything of devastation that comes into their lives was brought on because of the decisions that they themselves made. They were self-invoked. They, they, every decision that they made, what were they making? They were choosing to come out from under the boundaries that God had established for His people to live in. Did you realize God has boundaries for us to live in? And they're good boundaries. It isn't this great big fence that God's built that says, I don't want to, I want to keep you away from the good stuff. It's God saying, these are the boundaries that if you live in these boundaries, I will pour out my blessings upon you. Everything that I have intended for your life, for your fulfillment, for your family, everything will be fulfilled if you're living in the boundaries because I designed you, I know how life works best. So it's not God saying, I'm going to unleash this great army on you just to get back at you. That's not what God is saying there. And I hear that attitude come up all the time. So I'm constantly men mentioning it. God doesn't want to slap you upside the head. Although some of us need it. 
In fact, there's verses that, that speak to this, this truth, and I want to mention a few of them. In Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22, it says, Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed. There's an overshadowing of God's presence, God's grace, in this entire world that hinders the enemy from total annihilation of mankind. If it wasn't for God's overshadowing mercy, every one of us would be consumed. God's grace, His mercy, His presence is overshadowing us. There will never be one person lost because God willed it. There are those that believe that, and I don't know how they believe that, because there are verses filled through Scripture, just like 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering. Everybody say long-suffering. Aren't you thankful God's long-suffering with you? <laughs> I made mistakes. You made mistakes. God's long-suffering. And then he says, he's not willing that any should perish, any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The will, the heart of God is that all mankind would be saved. He doesn't want to see one person lost. And they say, well, how can a good God create some place like hell? He didn't create it for man. Scripture says he created it for the devil and the other angels who followed him that rebelled against God. But man chooses to go there. No one will ever enter into hell because God said, I want you to go there. It's because we choose to live outside of the boundaries of God. In Psalm 91 verse 4, we have another picture of this overshadowing grace. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. A buckler was a, a small round shield that had a place for your hand. It was maneuverable. And this doesn't say, church, that God's a big bird. Okay? It's poetic imagery. But it's saying like, like coming under a, a, a mighty eagle's wings. There is refuge in the presence of our God. There's restoration. There's healing. There's deliverance. There's salvation in the presence of our God. No one ever is going to experience the horror of hell because God wanted them to. It's because like Israel, we step out of the boundaries of God. But it's interesting how many people I run into that want to stand before God someday and they want to base all of their goodness on their own righteousness. They want to stand before God. God, you, you need to let me into heaven because here's my list of good things I did. I walked a dog. I helped grandma across the street. I tried not to say bad words. I tried not to hurt people. I didn't do it too much. Church, what does the Bible say about our righteousness? It's his filthy rags. I'm thankful that when I stand before God one day, I'm not going to stand there and say, God, you need to let me into heaven because, man, I was, I was a pastor. <laughs> I don't think that's going to do it. I was raised in a Christian family. I went to church from the time I was a baby all, the, all through my life. I went to church, so you need to let me in. No. No, church, no. I read the Bible. I tried to live by the Bible. You need to let me in. No. It's not our righteousness. Yes, we need to do good things. Yes, we need to read the Bible. Yes, we need to live according to the Scripture. Yes, we need to live in the boundaries that God's established. But our righteousness is the righteousness of Jesus. I know I'm entering into those pearly gates, not based on my righteousness, but it's based on His righteousness. Amen. My ticket is sealed. I am His. I belong to Him. And the righteousness of Jesus has been imputed to me. When Jesus looks at Milt Michener's record in heaven, He pulls out the file, looks up Milt Michener. It says, sinless.
Why? Because all my sin was nailed to the cross with Jesus and his sinless righteousness was imputed to me. Amen? Church, don't go around with an arrogance or a pride. Oh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a good little Christian. We need to live humbly and recognize that Jesus is our righteousness. Jehovah said canoe. That means the Lord our righteousness. Amen? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. I'm never going to stand before God and say, look at what I did. I'm going to say, look at what your son did for me. Look at what Jesus did for me. Look at what Jesus did for me. In this passage, the Lord's saying, the army of locusts swept through the land, but it didn't have to happen. Everybody say, it didn't have to happen. It didn't have to happen. God had made a covenant with his people, a covenant to bless their agricultural efforts, to bless their economy, to bless his people. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 1. It, that's my fa one of my favorite Old Testament passages on blessing. I love that and I refer to it constantly because this is the heart of God. Listen to it. Now it shall come to pass if there's a condition if you diligently, everybody say diligently. Obey. obey. Everybody say obey. Diligently obey. That's what we've called to, been called to. That's what's on our side. If we are diligently obedient, the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. It was a promise that Israel would be blessed and be a, a, a city on a shining hill to the rest of the world. People ask, ask all the time, Pastor Milt, why do you think America has been so blessed? It's easy. Because our foundation was based on the Word of God. Our founding fathers, the vast majority of them, were Christian, strong Christians and Many of our founding fathers were actually pastors of churches. They were ministers of the gospel. Why is our nation still being blessed? Because we had generation after generation of men and women that were Bible-believing, born-again Christians, and it built a foundation for this nation that has exalted the United States of America above every nation that has ever existed in this world. But the sad part of that, we have come out of those boundaries. We're murdering our children in our mother's wombs. We've taken God out of our schools. And in my lifetime, in my lifetime, I have seen our schools take a nosedive. In, what was it, 63? They took God out of our schools. When I, when I was growing up, we didn't have the trouble we have today. We didn't have anybody with a gun that was coming in and shooting kids. And I guarantee you we had more guns on the property than they do now. I grew up with, in Texas with a pickup with a shotgun or a twenty-two, you know, in my car. I never had the idea to take it into school and shoot somebody. Why? It's a hard issue. It's a heart issue. We've taken God out of our schools. We're not teaching the kids. We're not praying over the school day like they did for years. And now we wonder, what's going wrong? We're spending more money than ever in our schools. Duh. We've taken God out of our schools. And we fastly see the other nations are rising. We're not, all, unless America turns around, we're not going to be that beautiful city on the hill. We need to pray for America. You say, oh, but we've got a new president. So? We still have a government that's filled with corruption. We still have a nation that murders its children in their mother's womb. We are still stepping outside of the boundaries of God. I'm thankful that we are having prayer meetings in the White House once again. Don't get me wrong. I'm thankful for the godliness that I do see in our government. But church, there is so much more our nation needs. Right? And that totally wasn't in my message today. It goes 
It goes on, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. I love that. No matter how fast your life gets, you can never outrun the blessings of God. You cannot outrun the blessings of God if you're diligently obedient. He will chase you down, overtake you, and bless you. That's what the Scripture says. All these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. And then in verse 4, here's the one I wanted to point out. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body when, you bring, when, you, when you're obedient, diligently obedient. That means immediately, wholeheartedly obedient to the Lord. God says, I'm going to bless your children. Your life makes a difference. But listen to this, the produce of your ground and the increase of your herds. There's the covenant promise of God for his people if they live in the boundaries. The increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. Because they didn't live for the Lord, the locusts came in. They devoured. Instead of receiving the blessing of God, they received devastation. And church, that's still a spiritual principle for today. Why, why do you say, why am I blessed? It's because I'm diligently, wholeheartedly serving the Lord. I'm doing, does it mean you're perfect? No, but it means when, I'm, when I make a mistake, I'm convicted, the Holy Spirit deals with me. Lord, forgive me, help me, empower me to overcome that, not to do that again. Lord, I want to live for you. And you go on. In Joel chapter 2, verse 1, Joel is crying out for the people. Listen to what he says. Does anybody remember that song? Was it from the 80s or 90s, Gary? Blow the trumpet in Zion, Zion. That was a way back there. I'm dating myself. There was a song, and everybody loved it. Oh, I love that. Blow the trumpet in Zion, Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Blow the trumpet in Zion, Zion. Everybody thought, oh, that's got a good beat. I like that. We didn't have a clue, most people, that that was Joel sounding the alarm that judgment was coming against the nation. That's what he's saying. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. And he calls, he's calling judgments coming because we've stepped out of the boundaries that God has established for us. We need to get back into the boundaries that God has for us. It was a call that there was a devastation that was coming because they were violating what God had told them to do. In verse 2, he says, Hear this, you elders, and give ear, all you inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days or even in the days of your fathers? Have you ever seen anything like this? How many have ever been there? You say, I can't believe this is happening to me. You have one thing come against you, and you think, oh, I made it through that. And the next thing you know, something else hit you and something else hit you and something else hit you. That's what the enemy wants to do. Amen? Blow after blow. And he's, he's announcing to the nation, blow the trumpet, sound the call that, that judgment is coming against the land if we don't heed the voice of the Lord. He, he calls out, it's interesting, in verse 4, he, again, he, he, taught, he says the circumstances, the chewing locusts and the swarming locusts, the, the, swarming lo the crawling locusts, all, and the, all these locusts, one after another. And then verse 4, he says, Awake, you drunkards, and weep. Awake, you drunkards, and weep. He's calling to the lowliest in the community, those that are just drinking themselves away. He says, Wake up! And then he goes to the spiritual leaders in this same chapter. He says, gird yourselves and lament, you priest. He's calling to the spiritual leaders. Spiritual leaders, rise up. Sound the alarm. You need to hear what God's saying. Call the people back to God. Call them to repentance. Our companion text in Acts takes this message and Peter, on the day of Pentecost, he is quoting from the prophet Joel. 
And I love verse 39 in Acts chapter 2. That's the only verse I want us to look at there. In Acts chapter 2, Peter stands up. He's preaching. He's preaching to the people that were so angry, they were shouting, crucify him to Jesus. Now there's a holy boldness, and he's sounding the alarm. And he's, he's telling them, the rain has come. The time of the latter rain, the time of the restoration of God's presence is coming. Listen to what he says. And then he, at the end, in verse 39 of that, that passage, he says, For the promise is to you and to your children, and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. I love that. What's he saying there? He's saying God's presence is not just for a single ethnic group. It's for every ethnic group. He, he's spanning time. He's saying it's not just for you, those that are accepting Jesus today. It's not just for your children, but to all those who are afar off. As many as the Lord our God will call. Oh, I love that verse. I, it stirs my heart. Why? Because I hear about the awesome things that God's done in the past. I, hear, I read about the revivals of the past. And I think, oh Lord, what would have it have been like to have been in that revival and seen you move so mightily? And this verse reminds me, church. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what He's promised to do then, He's promised to do for us too. Amen. And when I think about my grandchildren, most of you know that Michelle just had a, had a baby boy just three months ago, and he's huge. If you've seen him on Facebook, he outgrew, he, out, he outgrew all of his clothes when he was born. He didn't fit in, I mean, three months, he was already past it. Melinda had to go send him some clothes yesterday. He's huge. But when I think about the promise of God, something stirs in my heart. Because I think about the anointing of God that was upon my grandfather because he lived for God. I think about the outpouring of that, that, that rain of his presence that was in my grandfather's ministry. And then I think about the same outpouring of God's presence in our church and what God's doing right now. That same outpouring of His presence. And I, I, I get excited. If the Lord doesn't come back, I know that He, my grandson, He's going to accept Jesus Christ. I claim that in the name of Jesus. He's going to be a mighty man of God. And He's going to, he's going to experience that same outpouring of the presence of God. It wasn't just for one generation. It wasn't one, for one, one group of people. It's for all flesh. It's for anybody who hungers for it. Anybody who thirsts for it. It's for you. It's for me. We're living in the days of the latter rain. We're living in a time when we can experience that outpouring of God's presence that brings that restoration, that brings that healing, that brings that strength to our life. We're living in the days of the latter rain. Does anybody like that? Oh, that promise is to you, it's to your children. It's to all your descendants. And I love that. Those words were spoken in a time of total devastation. They looked and everything had been stripped. They were struggling. And God says, I'm going to restore your years. In verse 28, and it shall come to pass after, afterward. In verse 25 is where he talks about, I will restore to you the years. Just three verses later, God's, God's speaking through the prophet Joel, and he says, and it shall come to pass afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. That means our sons and our daughters, we're living in a time when they will experience the rain from heaven. They'll experience the presence of God, and they will not be ashamed. They're going to be holy 
Bold is what they're going to be. They're going to preach the Word of God, speak the Word of God in the power of God. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. That means there's going to be a fresh revelation of how good God is. Amen. And it's going to happen not just to the seniors who've experienced it in the past. It's not going to happen just to the young, but on all flesh. It doesn't matter how old or how young. You can experience a greater revelation of the grace and the mercy and the love and the goodness of our God. The prophet Zechariah, we looked at it last week, and I want to touch on it just a a moment again. In chapter 10, verse 1, he said, Ask, ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. We don't just just accept it's going to happen. Yes, there's been prophetic words given. We're going to see a great end-time move of God. There's been prophetic words for our valley. There's been prophetic words for our church. But that doesn't mean we just sit back and say, Well, God's going to do something good. Come on, God. That's why every Sunday night we're in these altars and we're crying out for God, Lord, send the rain. That's why we come and we sing and we praise and we worship. That's why every one of us is called to pray. Lord, I want to live in that presence. Amen? And I don't want to have an umbrella. Some of you pray for rain, then you walk around with a spiritual umbrella. And you need to get wet. You need to get soaked. Amen? Amen. That's a whole other message. I'm not going to go there. The Lord Lord will make flashing clouds. Here's God's answer. If you ask me for it, I'm going to send a thunderstorm. There's going to be a downpour. But you need to ask. You need to ask. He will give give them showers of rain, grass in the field for everyone. For the idols speak delusion, the diviners envision lies. They tell false dreams, they comfort in vain. Therefore the people wend their way like sheep. They are in trouble because there is no shepherd. There's two things I want to point out in that passage. This week I had had an encounter, a young man on Facebook. I read his post. He was combining Hindu gods, the three Uh, prominent Hindu gods, Brahman being the first, he was saying that he was the same as the Creator, God the Father. And the second God was equal to Jesus, just a reincarnated Jesus, or Jesus was a reincarnation of Him, something like that. Anyway, I began to dialogue with him. And when I would give him Scripture that said, there is no other name under heaven given under heaven whereby men must be saved. It's the name of Jesus. He came back and he, he had all these different things that you could tell his mind was just filled with garbage from the enemy. We're living in a time of delusion, church. And then it goes on and says there weren't any shepherds. Thank God for shepherds. Are they perfect? No. Shepherds mess up too. But thank God for shepherds under the perfect shepherd. Shepherds that love the church. Shepherds that care for people. Shepherds that want to see people restored and healed. Shepherds that aren't ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it's the power of God and the salvation to everyone who believes. We're getting fewer and fewer of those shepherds today. Everybody's trying to be politically correct. And if you've been here very long, you know I am not politically correct. But I strive to be biblically correct. Church, God hasn't called me as the pastor to be the only shepherd in this body. He's called every one of us to have a shepherd's heart and to shepherd those who we have been given authority to speak into their lives. We've been given God-given influence. It may be at your job, at school, wherever you go. God's given you the ability. He's given you friends and family. Influence them. Influence them. 
Influence them. Be a shepherd to them and point them to Jesus. Point them to Him. Amen? I want to be a church filled with shepherds. In verse 2, they're in trouble because there is no shepherd. How many of us still preach that this is the infallible truth of God? The young man that I was talking to, one of the main issues is that he doesn't take this text as anything better than the Hindu text. And he's trying to combine them all together. And I'm believing that God's going to restore him. I'm going to put his name in our red book and we're going to pray for him as a congregation. That God would set him free. Because it's exactly what this passage is talking about. The lies and the deception of the enemy. I will restore to you the years. Church, there's no circumstance that is too devastated in your life that God cannot restore it. I'm going to say that again. There's no devastation in your life that God cannot restore the years. He's greater than all your sin. He's greater than what drugs has done in your life, what alcohol has done in your life, what immorality has done in your life. He is greater than all that. He can restore what those years took from your life. In Zechariah chapter 10, verse 1, ask the Lord. We've got to have that heart to ask. In Hosea 6, chapter 6 and verse 3, the prophet has the same message. Let us know. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth established is the morning. He will come to us. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and the former rain to earth. In Luke John the Baptist, Luke chapter 3, John the Baptist is quoting from Isaiah chapter 40. Listen to what John the Baptist says. He's talking about restoration here. He says, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way for the, of the Lord. Make his path straight. Then listen to this. Every valley shall be filled. What is he saying there? He's saying that what sin has eroded in the valley of your life and took you to that deep place of depression, that God's going to restore the erosion in your life. He goes on and says, every mountain and hill brought low. Some of us face mountains of problems. They're just huge. They're overwhelming. We don't think there's any way to go over them. We don't think there's any way to go around them. And God says, I'm going to take those mountains of problems and I'm going to knock them down flat where you can go right straight through. Then he goes on and says, the crooked places shall be made straight. The things that are bent up and twisted in our lives. God says, I'm going to straighten them out. Amen. Amen. The rough ways, I'm going to make them smooth. Everybody, anybody ever have a bad day? It's a rough day. God says, I'm going to make it smooth. And all flesh so see the salvation of God. Why does God bring restoration in our lives? So that the world will see God's love for us. They'll see God's salvation is real. It's genuine. God can take a life that's ruined itself and God will restore. Why am I so passionate about this? Because restoration has been a huge part of my ministry for years. When I came to Alaska and we went to Wrangell, it was a church that had been devastated. There were 16 people in that church, including men, women, and children when we came. I looked at Melinda and looked at the kids and I said, we've got to be in agreement on this because I don't want to drag y'all into this unless you're with me because we got to keep our eyes on the Lord 
I told you last week about the heaviness that I felt. I said, we've got to deal with that heaviness. And we just begin to pray and we begin to worship and we begin to press in and draw close to the Lord. And things begin to change. There begin to be a restoration. And there, there was a restoration in the physical building. There was a restoration in the hearts and the lives of the people that had been wounded and hurt. And God began to, to build that church up and it's still going strong today. It's still a good, healthy church today. When God called me to leave there, it was really difficult because I loved it and we, were, we had entered in, things were going good. Have you ever been called someplace when you'd worked through something really hard and it was going good now and God says, okay, it's time to go. But God, I just went through all that and it was hard. Now it's good. I want to stay a while. I want you to picture this. I was finally, at first when I went there, the church couldn't pay me. I was having to work outside the church. Finally, the church had built up. They could pay me a livable wage, and God calls me to leave. And he calls me back to Texas, no less. I'd escaped from Egypt. I didn't want to go back. But there was another church that was hurt. And the pastor was retiring, and he, he was kind of an interim pastor, and he said, I, Milda, he said, I just couldn't turn it around. And he said, I believe that God told me that you're supposed to come and that we're supposed to ask you to come. And I said, well, I can't do it. But God can. This time there were 15. I was, I was even going less. And this time there weren't any children. There wasn't any children at all this time. In fact, my worship team, I bragged about having the oldest worship team on, in the whole world. I had a drummer who was 81 years old. And he could still lay down a beat. The lady on the organ, organ was about 80, 81. Her husband was like 82. He was the bass player. Everybody was in their 80s on my worship team except for one, one lady. She was the young chicken, and she was like 55 to 60. And that was my worship team. Hallelujah. They huddled over in a corner. Uh, it was a, a large auditorium that would seat about 500 people. And on Sunday morning, they had rented the building out to two other churches because they didn't have the finances to even pay the building or keep the lights on. They were huddled over in a corner. The first Sunday I came, there were 15 people, and, and four of them were on the worship team up here. So that left 11 down here. And, and they were huddled over in a corner with a little podium, like a Sunday school class. And for that size church, it wasn't even a good Sunday school class. And that was the church. People looked at me and said, man, you're nuts. You have lost it. I said, God's a God of restoration. We did the same thing. We began to press in. We began to pray. We began to cry out for God's presence. And God began to to turn things around and I stayed there about four years and when, when we were there at, at the end of four years we had a children's program we had a children's pastor we had a, a teen program and a teen pastor we had a worship team that, that wasn't all older we still had some of them because they can worship too there wasn't anything wrong with that but we had some younger people too and we were steadily you know approaching you know numbers where we could sustain the church both of the other churches left we were we were station or solid again today i'm glad to tell you that the church is still open they've expanded their ministry now they have an hispanic church ministry outreach and they're still going they're still going forward still going strong why because god is a god of restoration god is a god of healing And I could go on and on with many other stories of restoration. Why am I so passionate? Because I've seen it in lives. And I'm going to close with this. I'm going to be very open with you. The last testimony I want to share 
is the testimony of my dad. My dad had a call of God on his life. He went to school to be a pastor. He got married. But then he went through a divorce when I was three years old. He ended up getting out of ministry, even though God had called him to be a pastor and to preach the Word. He was a good businessman. In most of my life, he still took us to church. He was still involved in helping churches, but he didn't want a pastor. And in the assemblies of God, if you go through a divorce, unless it's for biblical reasons, they won't allow you to hold credentials. And I'm a third generation Assembly of God pastor because God is a God of restoration. When my dad was in the late 70s, we were in Anchor Point and we were o- overseeing the little church in the Nilchik in that village. And they had about 10 to 12 people there. And I really felt impressed to call my dad and say, Dad, I need help. Will you come help me pastor Nanilchik? And because it was over my control in our church, I could bring him in even though he wasn't credentialed with the assemblies any longer. So I brought, brought Dad up. And over the next couple of years, the church was averaging over 50 every Sunday. There was one Sunday that I I drove to Nanilchik and we baptized 18 people together. And I'll never forget it. Why? Because God's a God of restoration. One of the sweetest memories I have is coming into the back door of the church and looking for Dad He wasn't anywhere there, and so I walked into the sanctuary, and I see my dad at the altar on his knees, weeping over that city, crying out to God, saying, God, we need you. We need your presence. And I heard him praying, and God began to stir my heart, and he he really spoke to me and said, I want you to see the restoration that I've brought your dad through. And God brought him full circle all the way back and restored him in ministry. Why? Because God's greater than our sin. He's greater than our failures. He's greater than the devastation that comes against us. The God that we serve is a God that restores. I want you to stand with me. Worship team, would you come? I've seen God bring restoration in health. I've seen God bring restoration in homes, in families, in businesses, when they said, Lord, I want your presence. Church, that's why this series is so important. Because that restoration only takes place as the reign of God. His presence is poured out in our midst. It's in His presence. Restoration doesn't come just because we meet together. It's because we meet together in His presence. I want to ask the prayer team to come forward. I want to ask the worship team to begin to play. And I want want you to bow your head with me right now. And I want to ask you, church, I want to ask you, is there something in your life that needs to be restored? It may be, it may be trust.
Lord just gave me that. Somebody here, God wants to restore your trust. He wants to restore your trust in Him. He wants you to restore your trust in His Word. And restore your trust. But there are godly people who want to be a part of your life and stand. whatever your need is this morning maybe you want to come and you know a friend that needs restoration you want to come and you want to stand in and pray for them maybe it's healing you need healing in your body God restore when we gathered together at at the top of the hill the Lord gave me a message a little devotion on Caleb I love Caleb and I pray for the same blessing of God on, on my life because Caleb when he was 85 years old It says he has had the strength of a man 45 years old. You think God is a respecter of persons? No. Does that mean God can supernaturally strengthen us and enable us to do what he's called us to do even though we're 85 years old? Hank, you're almost 85. I pray for the spirit of Caleb to be upon you. Amen. Let God restore today, church. Let God restore. Let Him restore. Let Him restore. Will you come? Will you come and let us pray with you today? Don't have to come But you always Show up in your splendor And you change the whole room You don't have to come But you always Show up in your splendor You change the whole room How can I see Thank you that you
for the love you pour out to ransom. 